It's the 11th of February, 1650. The French philosopher René Descartes is lying on his deathbed in the very house behind me here in Stockholm. The Swedish winter treated him harshly and a flu-like infection would become his demise. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. His most famous quote, and maybe even the most well-known saying in the history of philosophy. But he did much more than just this famous line. René Descartes is probably one of the most famous philosophers of all time. His works have greatly affected the Western world. And he wasn't just a great philosopher, but a scientist as well. So the big question is, what made him venture this far north? And what led him here? To answer this question, I have traveled to places where he lived, studied and worked. And I invite you all to come along this fantastic journey in the footsteps of René Descartes. Let's start at the beginning. On March 31st, 1596, René Descartes was born here in the village formerly called La Haye, but which now bears the name of Descartes in his honor. La Haye is a very picturesque French village that lies in Val de Loire, about 50 kilometers south of Tours. On the 3rd of April, our philosopher was baptized in here in the Catholic Church of St. Georges. Descartes' father, being a nobleman, wasn't very much present during his childhood, so he spent most of his time at his maternal grandmother's home. Unfortunately, Jean Brochard, René's mother, died tragically three days after giving birth to her fifth child. So she left a family of three children, Pierre, Jean and the youngest, René, in the care of the father, Joachim Descartes. In February of 1604, together with his brother, Pierre, René enrolled at the Jesuit school of La Fleche College, which lies about 130 kilometers north of La Haye. There, René were to receive a proper education. The first four years here at La Fleche College, René was taught grammar, Greek, Latin, poetry, and even rhetoric. But following these elementary years of studies came three years with a focus on philosophy. The first year of the study of philosophy was devoted to logic, and the second year to mathematics and physics, and the third year to metaphysics. A lot of his early education from La Fleche consisted of the philosophy of Aristotle. Because of the Catholic Church being based on many of his theories, theories which René later will dispute. In 1615, Descartes graduated from the school which he will later describe as one of the most renowned schools in Europe. But now he wanted to follow in his father's footsteps in becoming a lawyer. So he was in need of a university degree. The obvious choice was to study at the University of Poitiers because it wasn't that far away and he could also lodge at his uncle René Brochard's home. But his stay in Poitiers would be very brief. On the 10th of November 1616, Descartes graduated from the University of Poitiers. So now he was ready to follow in his father's footsteps a career in law but something wasn't quite right. Here he wrote. 
I have been nourished by books since I was a child and because I was convinced that, by using them, one could acquire clear and certain knowledge of everything that is useful for life. I had a great desire to study them, but as soon as I had concluded the course of studies, at the end of which one is usually admitted to the ranks of the learned, I changed my mind completely, for I found myself so overcome by so many doubts and errors that I seemed to have gained nothing from studying, apart from becoming gradually more conscious of my ignorance. So instead of pursuing a career in law, it seems that Descartes spent some time here in Paris before he would depart on almost a decade-long travel and research throughout Europe. Having a modest inheritance, Descartes thought himself financially secured to pursue science instead of law. So in the first part of the year 1618, René departed north for the United Provinces, present-day Netherlands. At this time in history, this part of Europe were at war with Spain, so he was more or less traveling into a war zone. But he arrived initially here in Breda in the Netherlands, which was on the truce line between the warring parties, and here he would meet a very special friend of his, Isaac Beekman. Beekman was seven years older than Descartes and had studied theology, literature and mathematics at Leiden University. And they began discussing geometry and mathematics. And this led Descartes to write his first work, an essay called Compendium of Music. There is some speculations that Isaac Beekman was actually more than a friend and a mentor for René Descartes. For instance, he referred to him as his special friend. And the letters are very affectionate, even by 17th century standards. Not only about your mind, although that may be the most important part of you, but the whole man and meantime love me and be certain that I would forget the muses themselves rather than you for they have bound me to you by a permanent bond of love. While in Breda, René decided to join the army and on April 29, 1619 he embarked for Germany and it is said that during his time in the army is where he had three odd dreams that would come to change his life. So at this time Descartes was in the service of the Catholic army and they were stationed at Neuburg and in November of 1619 he locked himself up in a room with a stove to escape the cold and then he fell asleep. He dreamt that he was walking along a road and terrifying shadows was haunting him, forcing him to go left rather than right. And then he saw a college gate that was open. And he ventured for the college chapel in order to pray. But then he saw a man on the road who recognized him and called him by his name. And then he saw another man in the college yard greeting him. The first man gave him something that looked like a melon from a foreign land. The wind was throwing him around constantly and then he fell. And all the people who talked to him was unaffected by the storm. And when Descartes woke, he thought that the dream must have been conjured up by an evil genius who wanted to deceive him. And this concept will be very important in René's philosophy later. And he wrote in February the next year that he was working on a philosophical treatise. Descartes left the army in 1620 
and traveled around Europe for almost two years before he decided in February of 1622 to return home to France. And now he was determined to become a scientist. Here in Paris, Descartes would meet another very important friend of his, namely Marsen, a mathematician and philosopher. And during the following years, Descartes would begin working on a number of different projects. The following years were unfortunately not very productive. He was working on a book called The Rules, which was a search for a universal method to guide the mind to truth. But this book was never published, but some of its ideas made it later into his future masterpiece. So in the year of 1629, René once again traveled to the United Provinces. The reason why was simply to avoid distraction from his work. In the year of 1630, René Descartes lived in Amsterdam, but in May he abruptly left to come here to the city of Leiden to once more become a student, but this time in mathematics. But now he was living a scattered life in the United Provinces. During the course of four years he had at least five different addresses. And it was during this time he was working on his first major work, Le Monde or The World. The World is really more of a scientific book than anything else. It covers subjects such as the anatomy of the human body and the nature of light. But all these years of diligent work would only result in a book never to be published during his lifetime. The reason Descartes never published Le Monde was because it contained a similar heliocentric worldview that was supported by Galileo Galilei. And in the year of 1633, Galilei was put on trial by the Catholic Inquisition. And Descartes also knew that 14 years prior, the Italian philosopher Vanini had been put to death in Toulouse for the crime of atheism and blasphemy. So René knew that publishing Le Monde could lead to his demise. Instead of publishing the world, René Descartes began working on two new projects, one on optics and one on metaphysics. And he actually lived here in Amsterdam, right behind me on this very address. And during his time here also met with another important figure, Constantine Huygens. During his time in Amsterdam, Descartes happened to make one of the servant girls in the household, Helena, pregnant, which apparently wasn't that uncommon at the time. So on the 19th of July, 1635, René's daughter, Francine, was born. Unfortunately, she died from a scarlet fever at the early age of five. In 1637, Descartes finally published his masterpiece, Discourse on Method and Three Scientific Essays. The essays contains a lot of inspirations from what he wrote in the world, but with all the controversial topics removed. But more about this in a future episode. He really wanted his new ideas to spread wide. So he sent out a number of copies of the discourse to all around Europe. And it was also written in French instead of Latin, which was very unusual at the time. And also he invited people to send critiques of his work, which might have been a mistake. René received a ton of critique. He probably didn't anticipate so many letters rejecting his ideas. Even though he invited the critique, he only sent replies to a few people. It seems that he wasn't the humble type. The following years he lived a very reclusive life in various places in the United Provinces. 
spending his hours with research and writing letters. In the year of 1641, Descartes were to publish his second masterpiece, The Meditation on a First Philosophy, probably one of the most important books of the 17th century. The book's impact on philosophy is immense. There was a big controversy with the meditations. Not only was it critiqued by the renowned philosopher Thomas Hobbes, Descartes was accused of homosexuality and atheism by Martinus Schuck. Because in the book, Descartes tried to find a fundamental truth which he could base all other knowledge upon. And in order to do so, he deployed his skeptical, systematical doubt. But Martinus Schuck thought that the doubting, the skepticism was so good that really Descartes only was an atheist in disguise. This man competes with Vanini in this sense, while giving the impression of combating atheists with his invincible arguments, he injects the venom of atheism delicately and secretly into those who, because of their feeble minds, never notice the serpent that hides in the grass. Fortunately, these accusations never led to anything severe. It probably only led to even more publicity for our fa famous philosopher. But in May of 1643, Descartes craved for even more solitude, so he decided to move here to Edgemont and den Hoef. And at this time, he also started exchanging letters to a very important person, namely Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Princess Elizabeth was born on the 26th of December, 1618, in Heidelberg. Her father, Frederick V, reigned as King of Bohemia for a very brief period between 1619 and 1620. After his defeat at the Battle of White Mountain, he was forced into exile, so they ended up in the Netherlands. Elizabeth was very much intrigued from reading Descartes' meditations, so they began an intellectual correspondence which resulted in 59 letters. René's correspondence with Elizabeth would more or less result in a book, The Passions of the Soul, which is a deep reflection upon our human emotions and passions. Of course, I will make an episode about this book, so make sure to subscribe if you want to know more about that one. In the summer of 1647, René Descartes returned to France in order to settle some private affairs. But while he was here in Paris, he would meet a very famous philosopher and mathematician, namely Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal was a mathematician, physicist and philosopher. Pascal was born in 1623, so he was actually way younger than René. He is famous for his pressure experiments with mercury barometers. And now our unit for pressure is named after him in his honor. He is also famous for the so-called Pascal's wager, in which he argued that it is rational to actually believe in God. Apparently, Pascal and Descartes had a very heated argument about the very nature of vacuum. Descartes had argued ever since he wrote The World that vacuum is unachievable and it doesn't exist. Here, Pascal's sister wrote about the whole thing. They then discussed the vacuum, and Monsieur Descartes was very serious as they described an experiment to him. When they asked what he thought had entered into the syringe, he said, subtle matter. My brother replied as much as he could at this point. 
and since our unit for pressure today is called Pascal, I bet you can figure out who was correct on this matter. Because of his contribution to philosophy, René received an annual pension of 3,000 livres in order for him to sustain his work. But there was no requirement for him to stay in France. So, of course, he once again took off for the United Provinces. Princess Elizabeth wasn't the only royalty who admired our famous philosopher. The Queen of Sweden, Christina, had found René Descartes' work very interesting, which would later result in an invitation to Sweden. At this time, Descartes had plans to retire for good, and he also feared for his health, so such a long trip to cold Sweden was unthinkable. He was trying to find every reason he could not to go, but it's kind of hard to completely say no to high royalty during the 17th century. Here he wrote to the Queen's librarian in Stockholm. Monsieur Chanu will confirm that, before he arrived here, I had prepared my few travel accoutrements and that I tried to overcome all the difficulties that a man like me faces at my age when he has to leave his usual residence to undertake such a long journey. However, despite the fact that he found me thus prepared to depart and that I also found that he was willing to use all kinds of reasons to persuade me to travel in case I had not decided to do so. Nevertheless, because he did not tell me that there was an order from Her Majesty to command me to make haste and that much of the summer has still to come, I mentioned a difficulty to him, which he thought it best that I should ask you to clarify. The Queen's librarian replied that Christina very much would like to see René in Stockholm, so now all the reasons not to travel was gone. Even though he was very much afraid of the Swedish winter, he stayed here in Edgemond throughout the whole summer of 1649 and didn't travel to Stockholm until the 1st of September. Having arrived here in Stockholm in 1649, René Descartes moved in together with the French ambassador, Monsieur Chani, in which whom he had exchanged a number of letters with before. Christina had a vague idea of starting an academy here in Stockholm. And that's probably the reason why she invited Descartes in the first place. But she also wanted to learn Cartesian philosophy. And in order to do so, she insisted upon them having their lessons at five o'clock in the morning during a Swedish winter. After only two lessons with the Queen, René began to question the whole enterprise so he already made preparations to leave. But Christina really wanted him to stay, so she tempted him by saying that she would induct him into Swedish nobility. So René, even though being afraid of the Swedish winter, decided to stay. René's fear of the Swedish winter was legitimate. On the 11th of February, 1650, he died with a flu-like fever. And initially he was buried here in this very cemetery. Christina insisted that the cat should be buried in Riddarholmskyrkan, which is very close to the royal palace. But since he was a Catholic, he ended up here, which was for the orphanage. Of course, Stockholm wasn't a proper resting place for our philosopher. So he had been reburied a number of times, but now he rests at the Benedictine Monastery of Saint-Germain-des-Presses. 
René Descartes lived a fascinating life and his impact on the Western world is incalculable. His thoughts still influence philosophers. I think, therefore I am, is probably the philosophical sentence that almost everybody have heard of. Cogito ergo sum.